Campfires on the beach are a memorable and long celebrated tradition of a Cape Cod summer. First Encounter Beach is one of the best places to see the sunset over the water on the Cape. This year, we are unable to gather together for such an event, but are still able to celebrate this tradition through selected stories and speakers commemorating the 400th anniversary of the first encounter between the Nauset people and the English who ventured to this beach on December 8, 1620, in search of a place to settle. 400 years later, those of us on Cape Cod still face many of the same issues. What is it like to be an immigrant here? How do the native people feel about our presence? How have humans impacted this area in 400 years? And how has the landscape changed? Please join us this summer as we explore these issues and the lore of East Ham over the years since this first encounter. You can find these campfire programs on the East Ham 400 website, posted every Sunday night in July and August. Welcome everyone back to the East Ham 400 campfire series. My name is John Hanlon. We are very honored today to have with us Earl Mills Jr., son of Chief Flying Eagle of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Earl is a Mashpee resident and was one of the uh, participants in the Mashpee 9 documentary. Welcome, Earl. Thank you. First, I wanted to ask you about that a little bit, the Mashpee 9 documentary. What was um, the background of that event? The Mashpee 9, it, it started off as a, the times were very different than now. We were looking at organizing our community and going back. It was a time of going back and, and re renewing traditions, renewing medicine. A, um, and so we, were, we had planned a community feast and gathering. And it, it is as though the stars were lining up. And we had the entire community, people of all ages, participating in this community day. There were a lot of things going on in the community that were bringing back old traditions, old cultural aspects. And it turned into quite a huge event for our small community. We had uh, the amount of food that was there would have rivaled the original Thanksgiving or maybe even surpassed it. It was all traditional food that we had gathered out in the bays and the fields um, that day. And uh, as is our way, we had uh, drumming, singing, cooking. It, it was all going on up in the woods in uh, what we call 12 acres, which is the, the traditional center of Mashpee, right up above Mashpee Pond. And the day went on and uh, in the evening time, things started going down, but the, the police were summoned uh, for noise disturbances. Uh, actually, uh, people heard the drumming, and they started getting nervous. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they thought, or their, their, their perception was that it was the war drums, and that we were, there was unrest. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's the, you know that's part of American persona, American ideology. That uh, you know when when the natives are restless, they start beating the drum, and next thing you know, they're going to come and burn down your houses. Um, actually, uh, it, uh, it was a social time, and it was a time of of, of camaraderie, you know, love and uh, uh, love and happiness, and. Uh, the, but uh, the, the powers that be saw it differently. Uh, ultimately, there was a mutual aid call put out, and policemen from Falmouth, Sandwich, Barnstable, Bourne, Mashpee, and State Police arrived at night after all the revelry was, was over, and ultimately 10 of us were arrested and nine of us were charged for... <laughs> ostensibly uh, 
disturbing the peace and in in that mix there was some uh, assaulting police officer types of things you know in the uh in the mix what year was that what was that 1975 okay so mid 70s mid 70s and and what was what was the context what was going on in mashpee at that time in terms of the tribe well there were uh land rights issues going on our there was a lot of there was massive development going on and uh, the uh the population of the town was changing very quickly uh, the, there was huge land sales like i said massive development and so the 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 uh the population of the town was was growing rapidly i think we were the fastest growing town in the state and there started to be tensions with our uh, access to hunting and fishing grounds. Uh, the, the, the political tensions were, 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 were growing because of the, the, you know, the, the control within town hall going from essentially changing from native controlled to non-native controlled community. Do you see um, now 40 years later do you see parallels in in the town of Mashpee, or have things evolved in different ways? Well, th well, things haven't changed that much. I mean, this the way things are. It, it's it's been somewhat of a constant, right? Going right back to the beginning, uh, Mashpee has always been somewhat of an isolated community, but there was always interaction with our hunters, fishermen across the Cape. Our, our hunting ranges and our fishing ranges always were very broad. During the Mashpee 9, there was a massive police presence. That was not the first time for us. Um, going way back to the King Philip's War, when in order to prevent us from participating in the war, the Plymouth Colony abducted women, children, and old people and held them captive on Clark's Island up in uh, up on the south shore there that was to ensure that our men didn't fight against them so so that type of behavior kind of instilled a certain idea in our heads in our community uh, later on the uh, the surrounding communities as they were encroaching upon our land felt uh, free to come into our community and cut wood Wood at one time on Cape Cod was a very valuable economic resource. And Mashpee being a, uh, a well-wooded community, people from Sandwich and Barnstable used to come in and cut wood. Finally, our men decided to, to put a stop to it. They, they referred to that in history as the Woodlot Rebellion. It was like in the 1830s. The state militia was called out against us. Now here you have a community of, you know, a few hundred souls, yet the state militia was called out. And again, it's the idea that the Indians are going to go to war, mm -hmm. even though we were outnumbered uh, 100 to 1. So this, this police presence into our community is, is a historical uh, occurrence that, that continues. And it, its intention is to quell the fire, you know, to, to put down any rebellion as it were, and it's actually becomes pretty effective. You know, the, the stormtrooper uh, ideology, it works. Mm -hmm. We see it today being used in some of our cities. Yes. Um, you know, they, when they, you know, the, the shock and awe concept, you know, as, as President Bush, you know, said during the, uh, during those wars, um, The, the number of police, you know, you have police dogs, you have police with riot gear, just coming into a quiet community that our police, our entire police force was a, was a, a dozen individuals. Uh, and that was, you know, many of whom were only seasonal employees. To, to, to have, you know, 
police with the riot gears, the shields, the uh, dogs, uh, paddy wagons. Um, it, it did put the fear of uh, force into many of our people. And so what, what started off as a cultural revival, a, a reinstilling of tradition and, and uh, pride, it, it changed very quickly. And we see that today uh, where, you know, police threat, police violence is meant to uh, intimidate, and it often does. Now, of course, the tribe has sovereignty, right? And it sounds like it wasn't really recognized. Well, sovereignty, sovereign is as sovereign does. Yeah. And you can... And because we are a, the minority of all minorities, we can act, but it, uh, we, we don't have the power of a larger group to, to, you know, to effect the kind of changes that we desire. I mean, we've had fissions, we've, we've had, uh, We've exercised our sovereignty within our Aboriginal rights as far as hunting and fishing. Um, and it has been successful, but those are smaller forms. When it comes to our broader land rights, that's where the big threat is. And for Native Americans, that, that land rights have always been the big issue in the United States and continue to be. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's shift a little bit back to the 400 years ago, with the first encounter between the, the f first marked in history anyway, uh, of that encounter between the Mayflower passengers and the, and the Wampanoag people here down the street at First Encounter Beach. Um, what, what does that mean to you, the 400th anniversary of that event? Well, it, 400 means that the, the English had been here for 400 years. But the English had been coming here for a while prior to that. Um, tr trading was always and continues to be a, an important thing around the world. When people bring materials that you've never seen or never had, it's, it's a good thing. You know, the English, the French, they brought in goods that were of value to our people. And it, that was a good thing. It was, you know, new forms of trade were good. But there was the bad side where people were abducted. Uh, uh, there, was, there were uh, murders where, where people were were killed for assisting, you know, the European settlers or pr prior to their settling. There were, when the Europeans came here and traded, oftentimes if they had somebody sick, they'd leave them on shore so that they wouldn't contaminate the boat. And there are times when, when, when our, the way of our people, we care for people. So people were brought in, doctored, helped, and, you know, put back on their feet. There are stories of times when, when f in gratitude, the people would murder their hosts and take, take their goods. It, uh, it created a lot of animosity within our people that many of our people didn't want the English to settle because they understood how they were. Others saw the economic value of the English, the trade goods, the... Uh, the market for our goods to England. And so it, it was a, a, a mixed uh, it was a mixed response as far as the, the English settling settling here. Hmm. And you have some connection to those first settlers in East Ham, right? Uh, 
lineal connections. Yeah. You, know. you tell us about that. <laughs> uh, well, in through my uh, oh, through my grandma's side of the family, we go back to the uh, back to the Mayflower, and um, though most of the the descendants today don't don't want us included in that in that there are, there are native a a well a large part of our native family that goes back to a an individual that was on the Mayflower and um i'm proud of proud and love all my relatives but the behavior of the group is was never uh something that our benefited our people it's always the group it's not the individuals you know right it, so how familiar are you with that story of you know that we read like in mort's relation with you know the the shallop that was exploring the the bay and in the morning the arrows started flying like is there other sides to that story how do you think that might have developed well like i said there there was there was a history and the history was often that people were abducted and there are there were quite a few individuals that um, were abducted and some of them made it back the famous ones being squanto and ipanau and the fact that you had family members abducted and, and never saw them again. <laughs> Today, I mean, it, it happens that we have the missing people and uh, it's a concern. And so if you, if you know who it is that's abducting your people, certainly you're not going to welcome them in and say, you know, put, your, put the rest of your family in jeopardy. So, th again... There were groups that saw those English as a threat based on past actions. Yet, as you said, they cared for sick people. Well, our ways are our ways. We have always, I mean, we are ostracized by Native Americans to our West for welcoming in the English. But it is our way, and they understand that. I mean, some people are welcoming, and some people are just warlike. You know, our, our way is to and within our belief system is to inv you know to welcome strangers to offer them food water and tobacco and it, it was many gifts within our cultural understanding were were given to us by strangers so that you never know who it is that you're welcoming in that could be you know a somebody that could be of great benefit to your people hmm. and there are many traditional stories that talk about that so those are our ways and and to to welcome in somebody that ends up doing you harm is it's again it's not on us it's on them mm -hmm. but you know we have to be true to ourselves in 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 sharing and in being that good-hearted way because that is our spiritual understanding hmm. what would you like people to know about the wampanoag people now in 2020 what does it what is life like for them here where are they well we the fact that we are still living in our own on our own land within our homeland is probably a miracle in in this country because of the genocide and, and displacement that has happened we are we as native americans are uh, among the few groups in the world living upon their own lands that have no control over their own lands. You know, the United States comes and, you know, supports other nations around the world to, to free the homelands of people and to bring democracy in and, you know, for standing up for what's right. But here in, in, in this, our homeland, the United States of America, we are just struggling for our rights, for our rights to our own homeland, for our rights to practice our ways within our homeland. Both, you know, our Aboriginal rights of, of hunting, fishing, to procure our way of life, you know, with our ceremonial ways. And uh, it's a fight. It's a struggle. And, you know, it's a, it's, it, it, the country as a nation speaks out of both sides of its mouth. 
in that it says it supports you know, freedom and equality. On the other side of the mouth is that you do as you're told, even though this is your land, we'll tell you what you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And we will use force to, to ensure that the United States way is going to be the way. So today, what would be an example of some of those struggles like to exercise your Aboriginal rights? Well, access. Access to even our, you know, this, those English came here ostensibly to be able to practice freedom of religion. Well, we don't have access to our own sacred religious places or the right to have you know, our ceremonial practices at these places because it goes back to land rights issues. So, I mean, imagine, uh, you know, people of, of, uh, of some place that, that have sacred places that have been sacred and holy to them for thousands of years. And, and the controlling government says, well, you can't, just do anything you want there. Maybe you need to have our permission. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can't get there at all because we don't want the disturbance there. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's hard to see the other, you know, the, the sh our moccasin on the other foot, you know. But it's, it, it's hard. It's a hard way to survive, to have your rights denied and, and to have to fight. I mean, literally fight to have your basic human rights. Mm -hmm. Where do most Wampanoag people today live? Well, uh, much of our tribe still lives within our, our Mashpee community, but not, they're not bound by that. We have people living all over. In increasingly, our people are living uh, further from home because of the, um, the economic struggle that we have. I mean, the, the, the land valuation as, as, because we don't have control of our own land, uh, it's, it becomes economically harder to live there. I mean, though we have a treaty signed by those founding fathers, you know, the signers of the Mayflower Compact, we have a treaty with them that said that our, our land could never be alienated from us without our consent. In the great and general court here in Massachusetts, twice convened meetings in Mashpee to ask us to surrender our rights to our land, and we, did not, we refused both times. But in the great wisdom of the great and general court, our land was made into a township and our common lands dispersed or sold off. And so since those days, we've been fighting for our land fighting to retain our ways, our, our, our rights, and the fight goes on. So during the 1970s, you were, you were um, 20 years old or so. What, uh, what was it like growing up in Mashpee in the 20 years previous to that, and then how did things change through, like, as civil rights developed? Well, I actually grew up in Falmouth, I spent a good amount of time in Mashpee with family. Um, and as my dad became chief when I was, I was an infant, and as the family of the chief, we were, we participated in tribal functions around New England area as representatives of our community. And so we, we took part in traditional gatherings, uh, ceremonies, uh, social functions around New England, so I I grew up with native culture, grew up with uh, knowledgeable elders and uh, head people that that uh, taught us from a very young age about the old ways and talking about our struggles, our our always talking about the land, wherever it was, and and and. Uh, aspects of the land that were of importance to us as a people. Uh, talking about uh, past battles like 
the, the annual commemoration at uh, Great Swamp, which was a, a big massacre that took place during King Philip's War. Uh, every year we would, we would gather there. Um, I always grew up with, with, with great pride in my, in my culture, but on the flip side of that is that I always had to put up with the ridicule, you know, of, uh, it's the American way to make fun of Indians. You know, and it continues. It, that type of ignorance is just part of the fabric of America. You know, watch out, he might go scalp you or, or you know, those kind of things that, that we still hear today that it, it, it's hard to believe, but, but because it is the fabric, people just don't realize that it, I guess they don't realize that it's offensive. Um, but that began to change in the, in the 1960s with the uh, the American Indian movement and the the movement for Native rights. The struggle it it kind of came to to a head in nationally at uh, 1973 with the Wounded Knee takeover. But prior, even prior to that, we come right back here to Plymouth to the original day of mourning, which took place, uh, um, Frank James Wamsutta was prevented from speaking at the uh, Thanksgiving Day commemoration in Plymouth because they, wa they wanted to censor his speech because they didn't want to hear the, the actual history of that of that uh, gathering. They wanted to hear a sanitized version. And so we began gathering at Plymouth and protesting on, on that Thanksgiving, the third Thursday in November. And people, Indians from all over the country were coming here. For, for it, it actually went from the day of mourning uh, when they took over the Mayflower went to the Bureau of Indian Affairs takeover. They called that the Trail of Broken Treaties. They left Plymouth, went to Washington, D.C., occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This was 1972. From there, went out to South Dakota, and, and the Wounded Knee occupation took place, in which case, in where uh, federal troops were brought out against the civilians, which is... I guess it's not legal, but it's different for Indians because mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not considered the same as most other Americans. So it was, uh, it was, I guess it's legal to take the army against us. But I grew up in those times and uh, I have family members that were, were, I was still young, but I have family members that took part in these things and that helped to shape me. I, I when I, got out of high school, I, I became a member of the American Indian Movement, and it helped to shape my, uh, my attitudes. My, it kind of sharpened my defiance. It, it gave me uh, strength to stand up to uh, fight against injustice. And so when, in Mashpee, our, our, our ways were always to kind of, kind of just let things be because of uh, we learned that over time but um, I brought a different attitude to Mashby coming back in and uh, having traveled around with the American Indian Movement out to occupations and uh, standoffs and so I guess I, I brought a little defiance into the community I wasn't going to settle for for my rights to be not recognized. And I, wh while I'm glad I did, I guess it, it, it led to a confrontation that today we call the Mashby Nine. When the police came in and, and, and told us that we were disturbing the, the peace or that we had to stop doing what we were doing, my response was that we were just Mashby people in Mashpee doing what Mashpee people had always done. 
the fact that we were drumming and people across the pond could hear it. People could also hear there was a, a lounge right close by to where we were. And that music used to emanate out. That it was rock and roll music, and the you know, that that music you could hear that across the pond. Well, the drumming and the singing was a threat, but the rock and roll music was not. So that whole double standard kind of infuriated me. Mm -hmm. And so my response to the police, I guess, infuriated them. <laughs> the, even though there weren't. You know, there were a lot of us at that time when the when the police came up and, and told us to, to keep it down. Um, I, I didn't believe it was that loud. Um, because of the lay of the land, the, the sound could carry, but it wasn't uh, anything above what everybody was used to. It was the nature of the sound that people were annoyed by or frightened by. But by the time the police came up onto 12 acres, there were, was maybe a dozen people there. There were, the police outnumbered us probably three to one when they came in. Um, and they were expecting trouble. I mean, they were, they were armed and geared up to the tooth. And I was actually sleeping when they came in. The fire was burning low. There was no singing going on. But it was a it was a massive show of force, and I mean we see that today. But in those days, I wasn't accustomed to that type of behavior by the the, uh, the constables. By the you know their their job was to keep the peace, mm -hmm. but they came in and uh, caused massive destruction. Who were the, the Mashpee Nine, the nine people that were arrested? The Mashpee Nine were nine men from, or we were all young men in those days, uh, that were Mashpees that were arrested there, yes. And what was, what was the aftermath of that incident? Well, it actually served to uh, galvanize the community. There were, we were supported by our community. There were, there were uh, town-wide meetings that were held in support of us, you know, ostracizing the use of force. Uh, it, it galvanized the community together. And it, 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 it served to demonstrate to, to each other where we stood in this whole picture of, uh, of America. Uh, it, it actually, it, it started into this, um, it ignited a movement within Mashpee that eventually turned into a, you know, a land rights struggle that went on to court and you know, continues on even today with uh, federal recognition and, mm -hmm. and uh, all the legal issues that are going on now around our land and our rights. But also right around that time with the whole land issue, isn't that when some of the big developments happened and the town really changed? Well, it was those changes that, that created some of these responses. There were the people in town, many of them were new to, uh, they weren't accustomed to living around Native Americans. And so their, their, idea, their ideas about Natives were what I talk about when we say that, that within the American fabric is this idea that Indians are dangerous people, mm. that they, you know, they're going to attack you, that you know, they, when they beat their drums, they're, you know, they're preparing for war, and uh, all, these <laughs> all these ideas that are, that is America. All of a sudden, these people who are Americans come into our community, and they, they, you know, they carry with them these ideas. And so it, it created trouble, it created uh, animosity, it created fear. And so the, the responses to us are typical American responses to Native American actions. You know, fear of, 
you know, uh, violence, fear of of some kind of uh, retribution for for what they've done to us as a people, the genocide, the land taking. Um, all this, the changes within the community, like, you know, were part of the cause for this uh, overzealous police reaction. Were they afraid that their land would be taken? It seemed like Mashpee developed a lot later than many of the other Upper Cape towns. Mashpee was a, um, Mashpee until the 19, late 1960s was largely undeveloped community. Uh, the, the, there were the largest tracts of open land unprotected within the Commonwealth. And developers in, starting in the 1960s were working quietly behind the scenes to put together their tracts of land you know, using English common law, you know. Uh, but land that was peti treated petition to, to the Wampanoag. Petition to partition because our land had been allotted in the 18... 30s, uh, Daw, the Dawes Act that took place nationally, well, it took place within Mashpee before it took place nationally because Dawes was a, uh, a member of the Great and General Court, and that land policy was tried out here before it went national. I mean, he, went, he went to Washington from Beacon Hill and, and brought that policy forth, mm -hmm. and it became the national Indian land policy. So our, our land was, was held within family groups, you know. So by the 1960s, large tracts of native-owned land were, were held by, you know, many people, large family groups. And it was easy to procure a, a share within that lot, then petition to partition, and people with money could, could buy these land, out, these land lots out, and they did. Okay. And so that the population changed rapidly and the, the feelings of the people that were new to the town was that of uh, more the American mainstream and, and, and very ignorant to the native aspects of the local community. And so uh, it soon evolved to be non-native people on the boards, things like that? The control of the town became... Uh, non-native, and the responses were dictated by those people in charge. We became part of the problem as, instead of just part of the norm. Mm -hmm. So shifting back down this end of the Cape, you know, at the, uh, we're in East Ham here, and the National Seashore owns much of the land of the Lower Cape. What what was the native involvement and presence here? The, the Mashpees didn't were separate. Well, there were many native communities across the Cape. I mean, if you go down, even in in, in eighteen sixty, the state did a report. They call it the Earl Report, and they accounted for every Indian within the Commonwealth. And in those days, there were still groups that considered themselves Wampanoag. There was the Yarmouth Band, you know, Deep Bottom Band. There were many. And many of the families that lived down the Cape here traced their ancestry to, to these native communities. Many of the practices, you know, they, they, they still consumed whale meat and things that are, that are native in origin, you know, even, even into the, you know, latter part of the 20th century. And so th there, and there has been connection with our family groups, with these families from down here in our hunting and, uh, and fishing traditions, and and uh, there was and continues to be interaction with these family groups, in our, in our family groups back in Mashpee. And that would have been the case back in 1620 between the the Nosset people that encountered that, the Mayflower. That was has always been the case. Yeah, where there is has been interaction and in, and in cultural, social, and uh, uh, interaction on all levels. Yes. Are there any, any, do they consider any people still uh, from the Nosset tribe or the Pamets? There, there, there are those people, and in, 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 uh, there are, like I said, there are people that, that are down in these parts 
that trace their, their lineage back, and and they they still interact with us. We we okay. interact. We have, you know, they they participate in in social and uh, ceremonial functions. Okay. So speaking of which, there's a picture of you when you were a young child at the dedication of the ceremony for the national seashore in in the early 1960s. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The native presence has always been part of things within the Commonwealth. I guess we're the back, the, we're part of the backdrop because this is our land after all. And when we see the undespoiled land, we make the connection with the Native Americans because that's how we maintain it. That's our reverence for it. And even I was just a young child when when we took part in the dedication over here, but we always see that as a good thing, that those lands will remain the way they, the the way the Great Spirit created them, you know, and that the that the that the the, the marks that Moshop and the, and uh, the others left behind will will remain, and. You know, so we were supportive of, as a community, we were supportive of the uh, the National Seashore and remain so, even though uh, perhaps our access to it is is not what we would have anticipated. And in terms of maybe being able to to forage uh, with some of the traditional uh, plants that the tribes used, is that something that is still a possibility? I know here at the National Seashore, you last year you were able to show us many of those things. Is that true in Mashpee as well? Well, foraging uh, has and continues to be important to us. That's uh, foraging for food and medicinal resources um, and other cultural aspects, uh, re cultural resources. Access is, is hard and um, we we're always looking for a a good relationship, or a, or a relationship at all with both the state and the federal governments, and local local community uh, governments for access to uh, to resources, uh, or for the maintenance of resources. Just to have the fact that certain resources still exist, because development changes that. Uh, Can you give us some examples? Well, a common thing today, a concern of, of some of the greater community was the, the declining numbers of monarch butterflies. And it turns out the um, milkweed is an important plant for the monarchs. But well, it's an important plant for us too. Uh, we, we utilize it as a food and we also utilize it as med medicine. Uh, and it, becomes, it, it has become harder to find because of development. Places like the National Seashore are a good resource in that they they don't allow land development. I mean, certainly a, it, it's a specific environment here. It's not there's not a lot of upland land, but uh, protecting natural resource like things of that nature are important to us. That these things still exist. That even if it's to even if it's to teach our young people about historical uses of things, to, for them to be able to still be present is important. Even if we couldn't pick them, if we can still take our young children to, to show them right. so that they're aware of these ways, because the day may come, we say, when, when these things are going to be very important. And so having a good relationship is important but having these resources available or even present within our homelands because this here east ham is part of our homelands it has been it was and it always will be a part of our homelands i just wanted to ask one last question um about the culture today what's what's going on do you have an opinion about some of the issues with mascot names and the state flag and things like that. Yeah, some people might say that it's 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 not harmful, but it's 
for me, it's um, disrespectful. It, it, it comes down to that. It's disrespectful. And we all would like to be respected for who we are. It's not, it's not harmful. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt my children. It certainly doesn't uh, make them proud <laughs> when we see the Red Raiders. And when they ask, well, what does that mean? Yeah. It means that uh, we, are, we are the Red Men. You know, we are the Red Men of the Western Hemisphere. But when they say it, the Red Raiders, they're talking about our warlike aspect that we're going to go raiding, you know, going to go, you know, as the, as the Romans would say, rape and pillage. That, that, is their, that was the Roman way. It's, maybe they were proud of it. It's not our way. We are a peaceful people, have been and will be. And to be portrayed as, as something that we are not, it's, it, it's hurtful, but it's, more importantly, it's disrespectful. And, and within our own homelands, we would like to be, if nothing else, respected. Even though our land has been misappropriated and our rights denied, minimally, we would like to be respected as a people for our ways, our culture, and our ceremonial life. Great. Well, thank you very much. I've learned a lot. I hope people in the audience have as well. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. 1970 was the 350th anniversary of the Mayflower arrival. Planners of the celebration in Plymouth wanted to add some Indian to the program, along with the regular Pilgrim or Mayflower descendants. They invited Frank James Wamsada of the Wampanoag to prepare a speech. Frank taught music at Nauset High School. The authorities read his text in advance and suppressed it. This is what he had planned to say. I speak to you as a man, a Wampanoag man. I am a proud man, proud of my ancestry, my accomplishments, won by strict parental direction. You must succeed. Your face is a different color in this small Cape Cod community. I am a product of poverty and discrimination from these to social and economic diseases. I and my brothers and sisters have painfully overcome, and to some extent, we have earned the respect of our community. We are Indians first, but we are termed good citizens. Sometimes we are arrogant, but only because society has pressured us to be so. It is with mixed emotion that I stand here to share my thoughts. This is a time of celebration for you, celebrating an anniversary of a beginning for the white man in America, a time of looking back, of reflection. It is with a heavy heart that I look back upon what happened to my people. Even before the pilgrims landed, it was common practice for explorers to capture Indians, take them to Europe and sell them as slaves for 220 shillings apiece. The pilgrims had hardly explored the shores of Cape Cod for four days before they had robbed the graves of my ancestors and stolen their corn and beans. Mort's relations describes a searching party of 16 men. Mort goes on to say that this party took as much of the Indians' winter provisions as they could carry. Massasoit, the great sachem of Wampanoag, knew these facts, yet he and his people welcomed and befriended the settlers of the Plymouth Plantation. Perhaps he did this because his tribe had been depleted by an epidemic, or his knowledge of harsh oncoming winter was the reason for his peaceful acceptance of these acts. The action by Massasoit was perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoag, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing that it was the beginning of the end, that before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoag would no longer be a free people. 
what happened in those short 50 years, what has happened in the last 300 years. History gives us facts and there were atrocities. There were broken promises. And most of these centered around land ownership. Among ourselves, we understood that there were boundaries, but never before had we had to deal with fences and stone walls. But the white man had a need to prove his worth by the amount of land he owned. Only 10 years later, when the Puritans came, they treated the Wampanoag with even less kindness in converting the souls of the so-called savages. Although the Puritans were harsh to members of their own societies, the Indian was passed between stone slabs and was hanged as quickly as any other witch. And so down through the years, there is a record after record of Indian lands taken and in token reservation set up for him upon which to live. The Indians having been stripped of his power could only stand by and watch while the white man took his land and used it for his personal gain. This the Indian could not understand for to him land was survival, to farm, to hunt, to be enjoyed, it was not to be abused. We see incident after incident where the white man sought to tame the savage and convert him to the Christian ways of life. The early pilgrim settlers led the Indians to believe that if they did not behave, they would dig upon the ground and unleash the great epidemic against them. The white man used the Indians' nautical skills and abilities. They let him be only a seaman, but never a captain. Time and again, in the white man's society, we Indians have been termed low man on the totem pole. Has the Wampanoag really disappeared? There is still an aura of mystery. We know there was an epidemic that took many Indian lives. Some Wampanoags moved west and joined the Cherokee and Cheyenne. They were forced to move. Some even went north to Canada. Many Wampanoag put aside their Indian heritage and accepted the white man's way for their own survival. There are some Wampanoag who do not wish to, it to be known they are of Indian for social and economic reasons. What happened to these Wampanoags who chose to remain and live among the early settlers? What kind of existence did they live as civilized people? True, living was not as complex as life today but they dealt with the confusion and the change. Honesty, trust, concern, pride, and politics wove themselves in and out of their, the Wampanoag's, daily living. Hence, he has termed crafty, cunning, rapacious, and dirty. History wants us to believe that the Indian was a savage, illiterate, uncivilized animal, a history that was written by an organized, disciplined people to expose us as an unorganized, undisciplined entity. Two distinctly different cultures met. One thought they must control life. The other believed that life was to be enjoyed because nature decreed it. Let us remember the Indian is and was just as human as the white man. The Indian feels pain, gets hurt, and becomes defensive, has dreams, bears tragedy and failure, suffers from loneliness, needs to cry as well as laugh. He too is often misunderstood. The white man in the presence of the Indian is still mystified by his uncanny ability to make him feel uncomfortable. This may be the image the white man has created of Indians. His savageness has boomeranged and isn't a mystery. It is a fear, fear of the Indian's temperament. High on a hill overlooking the famed Plymouth Rock stands the statue of our great sachem, 
Massasoit. Massasoit stood there for many years in silence. We, the descendants of this great sachem, have been a silent people. The necessity of making a living in this materialistic society of the white man caused us to be silent. Today, I and many of my people are choosing to face the truth. We are Indians. Although time has drained our culture and our language, it's almost extinct. We, the Wampanoags, still walk the lands of Massachusetts. We may be fragmented, we may be confused. Many years have passed since we have been people together. Our lands were invaded. We fought as hard to keep our land as you, the whites, did to take our land away from us. We were conquered. We became American prisoners of war in many cases and wards of the United States government only until recently. Our spirit refuses to die. Yesterday we walked the woodland paths and sandy trails. Today we must walk the macadam highways and roads. We are uniting. We're standing not in our wigwams, but in your concrete tent. We stand tall and proud, and before too many moons pass, we'll right the wrongs we have allowed to happen to us. We forfeited our country. Our lands have fallen into the hands of the aggressor. We have allowed the white man to keep us on our knees. What has happened cannot be changed, but today we must work towards a more humane America, a more Indian America, where men and nature once again are important, where the Indian values of honor, truth, and brotherhood prevail. You, the white man, are celebrating an anniversary. We, the Wampanoags, will help you celebrate in the concept of a beginning. It was the beginning of a new life for the pilgrims. Now, 350 years later, it is a beginning of a new determination for the original America, the American Indian. There are some factors concerning the Wampanoags and other Indians across this vast nation. We now have 350 years of experience living amongst the white man. We can now speak his language. We can now think as a white man thinks. We can now compete with him for the top jobs. We're being heard. We are now being listened to. The important point is that along with these necessities of everyday living, we still have the spirit. We still have the unique culture we still have the will and, most important of all, the determination to remain as Indians. We are determined, and our presence here this evening is living testimony that this is only the beginning of the American Indian, particularly the Wampanoag, to regain the position in this country that is rightfully ours.